Hello and welcome to the Practical Stoic Podcast. Today I have for you part two of our eight-part masterclass series with Kai Whiting and Leonidas Konstantikos, and uh, they are the authors of Being Better, Stoicism for a World Worth Living In. Uh, Now, this series is going really well so far. We're having so much fun with these conversations. What you're going to hear today is uh, the first 40 minutes of a discussion uh, about the unity of virtues, Uh, and I'll do a little bit of introduction uh, towards the start of the recording, so I won't bother uh, introducing it to you now, Uh, but what I will say is that there is uh, still about 40 or 45 minutes worth of conversation that we had with our Patreon members uh, and and Kai and Leo uh, after the conversation that you hear today. And that is available on my Patreon. So you can go to patreon.com forward slash Simon J.E. Drew. And there you can also get a whole bunch of uh, extra Seneca series episodes. Uh, as you'll know, I'm doing this series where I'm going through all of Seneca's writings. And I think there's a backlog of probably about uh, between 50 and 70 at the moment uh, episodes that haven't yet been released on this podcast. Uh, and they are waiting in my Patreon feed. Uh, so jump over there, patreon.com forward slash Simon J.E. Drew to hear this entire conversation. But I know that you're going to love what we have for you today. So the only other thing that I I would like to mention is that if you want to come along to these meetups in the future, these masterclasses, uh, then definitely go along to Simon J. E. Drew forward slash Patreon. I know it's basically just the reverse of the previous link I gave you, but there I actually have uh, a list of all of the topics that we're covering. We cover them every two weeks. We have these masterclasses uh, until the end of October. Uh, and so you can see all the topics there and you can actually register. I do ask that you become a Patreon member if you would like to come along to these meetups and, and ask questions and join in the conversation, but you can find all of the topics there. So without any further ado, I would like to present to you this conversation with Kai Whiting and Leonidas Konstantikos on the unity of virtues. So everybody, welcome again uh, to our discussion today with, with Kai and Leo on the unity of the virtues. A uh, very interesting topic. Uh, I've actually been um, thinking about this a lot and even talking with it, uh, talking about it with some of my clients recently, um, wrestling with this idea. Uh, I guess as a by way of a short introduction, a lot of the time when we come into stoicism, I know that uh, you know this is what I was taught, which is that there's kind of these four virtues. Um, which are kind of the core foundational cardinal virtues of Stoicism. So uh, if I'm correct, we do have wisdom and then we have courage, we have justice and we have temperance or moderation. Um, And the idea is supposedly uh, if you can find a situation in life that wouldn't be benefited greatly by using one of those four uh, virtues, uh, then... uh, Wait no, it's, it's it's if you can find anything that would be better than those four virtues, then then supposedly it must must be an amazing thing. Is similar to what uh, Marcus Aurelius talked about, and so then Kai comes along and says, "Well, there's actually a different side of Stoicism as well, um, and that that shows us that there is a unity of virtue, uh, meaning uh, obviously that there is." one correct action in each moment uh, that is what the sage is supposedly living as uh, that 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 perfect uh, decision maker that perfect discerner of events um, and so I, I don't understand this idea nearly as much as I would like to which is exactly why we're here today so I'm going to throw it over to uh, Kai or Leo uh, to jump in and uh, and tell me why the perhaps this is where we would start where do we get the uh, this might be a bit of history first. Where do we get the kind of cardinal virtue view of things and who within the Stoic canon brings into us the idea of uh, of the unity of the virtues? Leo, that is a definitely you question. If we're going into the history of terms of your starting, you're on mute, so you have to unmute yourself to... Right, right, right. Uh, I, okay, so... I, okay, so here's a problem for me, right? Is that... So often we talk about the Stoics. We, when, when we do talk about the virtues, which isn't as often enough as I'd like, and I'm very thankful to be here today to discuss this, but the problem is that um, it's hard to look at this in, without the Stoics' physicalism, right? The fact that um, 
in nature that that the soul is actually a thing. It's a it's a it's a body, right? To them, it's pneuma or whatever, but it's but it's a body. So the tension of the soul, the tension of the soul, a constant tension of the soul is what is virtuous, right? And now I don't want to just hand wave this away or poo poo this away as something mystical. I don't think it is. I think this is very very relevant in the fact that they don't have anything supernatural here. It's the state, the tension of the soul in. A human life. It's in harmony with the rest of nature, right? Humans are the for, humans. From reading the Stoics, right, are the kind of thing that can be uh, be led by false impressions because of their sense, and they can be out of harmony with nature. But if you have the kind of soul, the kind of tension of this physical soul, right, it's in harmony with the nature, then you will uh, do the right thing every time but from the kind of character that cannot but do the right thing. So what does that mean? If you look at Zeno, right, the, there's cer certainly we get the, the platonic virtues, right, the ju uh, justice, courage, prudence, self-control, but that is not just, okay, I'm going to be prudent today, or am I doing the prudent thing? It's often the way we think about it. I think that's what often misleads people when we think about Stoicism, right? Am I, am I doing something prudent? And I don't think the Stoics can say this um, plausibly, right? Well, for them, um, we, we aren't doing the prudent thing. We aren't doing the courageous thing because only the sage is, right? The rest of us, to the extent that we're, uh, you know, or to the extent that we're, we're progressing, right? We are developing the kind of tension of character of the kind of person that cannot but do the right thing. And you, if you ever, if we ever achieve virtue for the ancient Stoics, right? If we ever achieve virtue, you won't even really know it. You'll be, um, as, as, as uh, you know, as you can put it, you're eating your oatmeal one day, horribly, un, you know, viciously, terribly. And then the next spoon of oatmeal you're taking is virtuously and being done perfectly. Because all of a sudden, you will be developing the state of character over the progress of, of, a, of a human life that you can do it perfectly, and now you're virtuously and doing it happily. What I think we can get from this, right? What I, what I love about this is that we don't need anything supernatural here. This is developing a state of character, uh, like, like, like whittling. The way I like to think of it is whittling, your da whittling yourself down to a, into the shape, right? To this perfect shape. Um, of this kind of like you know you're developing yourself in this perfect square that is fitting in this in the in the in the square hole that is the rest of nature, and if that's true, then anything you do, or and it's say anything a sage does, is done virtuously. Now, there's a few ways to look at this. Ariston, right, who is the uh, this kind of unorthodox Stoic, he considers it like as a as a uh, as if you're seeing, right? Now, to be like to be prudent, it's like almost as if you were white seeing. You call your vision white seeing. And if you're being courageous, now you're black seeing, right? But still, it's the seeing and, it, and it's relative to itself, right? However, other Stoics have a different aspect of this. Um, for them, it's um, the when the the graceful man has graceliness everything you know when he when he's acting graceful okay or or is courageous when he's acting courageous but this is just a state of the soul that's going to do the right thing at a, at the at the right time now that means that uh, sometimes it'll look like grace, sometimes it'll look like courage, sometimes it'll look like justice, whatever. But in the end, it's just the state of the soul that is scientific knowledge of what is to be done at every time. Whereas I, who am by, but <laughs> I don't, I don't need you, I don't need to tell you guys. It's perfectly obvious that I'm no sage, right? But that if I, I could do something appropriately. Right? What is something appropriate? I could defend my country appropriately. I could defend my family appropriately. I could eat appropriately, but I won't be doing it virtuously. If I'm ever to the point where I can develop the kind of character that could do this unfailingly from the, from the tenor of soul that can do something with and can possibly be wrong at, uh, at, at doing it, right? Then I, whatever is, whatever is I do, if it, if it is in matters of distribution, it'll be just. If it is in matter of knowing uh, what is fearful and what isn't, then it'll be brave. But really that's just something that we call it, I think is what the Stoics have to say, right? Because at the end of the day, it's really the scientific knowledge, episteme of, of what is to be done. Uh, does that make sense? Mm. Yeah, I want to, <clears throat> I'm probably going to ask a two or three or 10 part question. So um, <laughs> there's a lot there. Firstly, I want you to dive into the, uh, the this idea that you brought in at the start of the soul, the, the perfect soul existing in that kind of tension and how 
does that possibly relate to what Heraclitus said when he said that harmony comes about by way of uh, binding opposites, uh, that kind of tension of the middle uh, middle way, which which I always think um, really there's there's and definitely if you read Seneca's writings, there's a middle way in Western culture just as much as there is in, in say, Buddhism and Taoism and, and all these um, uh, ancient philosophies of the East as well. Um, okay, so that how does that relate to Heraclitus' claims? Um, and then also in terms of the unity of the virtues, one thing that I was thinking this week which relates to what you were just saying is that um, in any given situation in life, you might be courageous in one situation, but what that situation actually calls for is courage and temperance, but you miss out temperance. Therefore, by definition, you are not being virtuous. You are just being courageous in that, in that moment. Um, and, and so is what you're saying that, well, I mean, it's almost exactly like the Christian story, right? It's like only God is good, which Seneca also said, right? Or only the sage is good, you know, can be good. Um, and the rest, we are all imperfect beings trying to attain that, but we'll never get there. But the unity of the virtues is that point that we're aiming at. I wonder if you could just comment on on those things. So, yeah, Heraclitus and also, does that sound like what you're saying at all? Yes. Um, I think what... The Stoics were very, very technical, very careful in their language, right? So let mm-hmm. me start with Heraclitus first, right? So Heraclitus, had, um, you know, he has this concept of fire, right? And the Stoics kind of borrow this, this kind of pneuma is a type of fire, right? Soul is a type of fire. Now, look, I'm not trying to sell you anything, right? I don't need your credit card number about this fire. I'm not trying to sell you anything mystical here, right? But what I, think I do, is important but about he this. doesn't. That's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So sorry. Um, what I what I think what I think is important here is when we talk about this um this pneuma, this soul, right? That for the Stoics, what is important to them is ascent, right? This is your the, the ruling faculty of your soul ascending. Now, what that means is for the Stoics, there's no there are no dispositional beliefs. And I think the first person I, that I read this from was uh, uh Brennan, right? But he's saying that okay, so if you think right now, um do you believe that there's an elephant on top of your car? Well, the answer is no, right? But where was that Where was that belief a second ago? It just didn't exist, right? Where we might call it, I have a dispositional belief about my mother's maiden name or about whether or not I, uh, you know, put gas in the car yesterday. Or for the Stoics, as physicalists, only bodies exist, right? So if only bodies exist, then I don't have a dispositional belief about my mother's maiden name or about whether or not there's an elephant on top of my car or whether or not how much a tree weighs in my backyard. This is not a dispositional belief that I have. I have a disposition to believe these things because the disposition is the real thing, right? But the belief is not happening until I actually have a belief about it. So what am I saying here? For the Stoics, this, this belief is a thing that is happening now right? Now, some of us could do the right thing. I mean, if we progress enough, we can do the right thing most of the time. We can have up the, the, uh, the pro- our proper functions most of the time, right? We have a belief and we can uh, assent to the cognitive impression, right? This, this impression that is clear and distinct and cannot be, cannot be false, right? Now, the sage, it, it's, to me, it's kind of like, I don't, I don't know, imagine playing tennis, someone th- something that I do not do and I'm too old to learn, right? But if you think about playing tennis, I might get on the court and I might hit the racket and imagine I get lucky and I hit the, ra- I hit the ball 10 times out of 10, right? That's as good as that's ever going to get and it will never get that good again. The sage, so to speak, can hit the, will hit the racket a million times, or hit the, the, the ball with the racket a million times out of a million because of the, the tenor of his soul, right? And if we want to take this into more modern terms, because of this condition, right? This, the, the, the tenor of his muscles, but think of it in the, in the mental sense. Now, what does this mean? Someone's character will make the right judgment a million times out of a million if they're ever put in this situation. So this kind of character, this kind of soul, right? This kind of physical soul will be virtuous. Now, sometimes that looks like, you know, wisdom, justice, courage, self-control. Where it's like Heraclitus is in this pneuma, this, uh, this type of like, uh, you know, fire that is the you know, same with the fire of the universe. But where I think that it's interesting for the virtues, right, is that it doesn't require anything mystical. 
And yet, it's not like Aristotle in the sense that I'm virtuous because, you know, the, uh, I'm, not, I'm just not virtuous with my community. No, this is something that is similar for me, which is similar with the, the rational cosmos for the Stoics. It's to the extent that I fit into this, this the, in harmony with the cosmos. Where it's important, I think, is because the Stoics understood that something's either in harmony or it isn't, right? There are no degrees of harmony for the Stoics. Either in harmony or you're not. You can approach it, right? But you're either in harmony or you're not. You're either in Miami or you're not. Now, once you are have that character, that tenor of the soul, then everything you do will be because you assented appropriately at that moment. And you because you have the kind of character that cannot do otherwise, right? You have the kind of character that in that moment you will assent appropriately. Sometimes that looks like justice. Sometimes that looks like courage. Sometimes that looks like self-control. Now, because of common language, um, I try... To be, you know how, like, you, for example, the word eudaimonia doesn't really translate to happiness. So we can we can see something, try to see something more like well-being or success. Well, to me, it's that sense with things that are like courage. You know, someone's being courageous, but not really. For the Stoics, what I like to do is, um, if I'm following any Stoics, I like to say someone is bold, right? Because that that seems to to to, to take the sense that someone is, uh, you know, is uh, has that chutzpah or whatever, right? but not to the extent to where they have a, a soul that cannot do otherwise. So you can be bold, mm. but you can also be unjust. You know, um, you, we, we see movies, like, you know, that's why, for, you know, if you're, if, if you're an American like me, gangster movies are so attractive, right? You have someone who's bold, but not just. Whereas for the Stoics, they wouldn't call that person brave, right? Because if you were brave, you would also be just. Right? And if you were mm. brave, you'd also be self-controlled. So Scarface, you could say, is very bold. But you can't say he's brave because brave is scientific knowledge of what is fearful, what is not, and what is neither. And if you have that, well, the secondary qualification is that you also know you're also being self-controlled. You're also being temperate, right? You're also being just. This is something our, you know, uh, the, the people we admire for being bold aren't, whereas a sage would be. Can I just ask one question there? How does that relate to uh, what Marcus Aurelius talked about when he, uh, well, I'm pretty sure many of the Stoics have talked about this, but they they had this idea that if somebody is acting out of accordance with better wisdom, uh, we should not be angry at them. We should, uh, pity is the wrong word, but essentially they're doing so because they're ignorant to the better way that things could be done. How does that relate to what you're saying now? Oh, interesting. Um, I, and I think this is the other aspect of harmony, right? And what is interesting for me is Marcus Aurelius was a tremendous badass. We, we must not forget that while he's writing his meditations at night, he's watching heads roll and guts spill during the day, right? Um, for 20 years, sleeping on, on cold germ in the ground of cold German forest in a, in a tent, right? So what he's seeing when he's watching these guts That's spill. That's basically roll, Marcus's life, by the way. Right. I'm right. so sorry. <laughs> oh, you mean this? Our Marcus. <laughs> right. <laughs> Another German. He's in good company. Right. <laughs> sorry, terrible joke. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, Marcus Aurelius, the other Marcus, right? What um what he's noticing, I I think, if I'm if I'm reading Marcus correctly, is he's watching how in you know, seeing a severed head or a severed arm, which he's watching every day, right? This is unnatural. Right, it's unnatural to be severed from the human body. It's not. It's not natural, but it's less unnatural than cutting yourself off from human nature, cutting yourself off from the whole. And unlike the severed body part, we, Marcus says, we, however, can rejoin the harmony. We can rejoin the whole. Mm. So, because of our reason and our sociability, like, you know, having a severed body part is not in your control. Being severed from the whole, being severed from humanity is absolutely in your control, which is what makes it more unnatural still, right? So when you have someone that is brave and wise and just and self-controlled, this is someone who understands that everything they do is for this whole, is as part of the whole. Not in the, not in the weak sense of like, yes, I'm dying for my country or for whatever. Um, further than that, just because, well, one, it's part of the cosmopolis of all rational agents, agents, right? R- rational social human beings. But I think um, even further, um, with rationality itself, 
when you tune your own rationality into your mind, right, to where you can no longer do what is wrong at all, then you have tuned yourself, right, like the, the well-tempered person, right, the well-tempered person has now tuned themselves to the harmony of reality. Whether or not you believe this or not is a different question, but I do not think the Stoics can be read otherwise than seeing the soul as a physical thing, something that must make a sense only in the here and now. There are no dispositional beliefs. There's no future or past to worry about. In the here and now, you must make the sense that are appropriate now. Sometimes that looks, if you are a sage, sometimes that looks like wisdom, sometimes like justice, sometimes like self-control, sometimes like courage, but it must necessarily have all these other other um, other virtues incorporated in it because it is a kind of thing that can that always makes appropriate decision no matter what. Um, did the Stoics think they were like this? No, of course not, right? This is for the, the Socrateses and the Diogeneses among us, right? Hmm. But um, but we can be better, by, especially by the time you get to the middle Stoics, we can be better than we were yesterday. Hmm. Yeah, okay. Well, th- I'm sure we're going to come back to a lot of what you've just spoken about. I, I certainly have um, some questions about the kind of... Um, well... <laughs> It's actually really good that I read a certain passage from Seneca last night just by flicking through to a random page um, that made me think, uh, man, this sounds a lot like a kind of theology here um, that people are trying to get at in terms of uh, understanding from a top-down approach um, you know, how we would find our ways towards some sort of virtue and, and, and very similar to a lot of what we hear from um, uh, from the the the. Christian theology as well. I'm just fascinated with that area. Later. So we're going to dive into that later because um, I want to ask Kai, uh, Kai, this unity of virtues, how do you apply this in your life? Like how, how does it help you to make better decisions, I guess, personally? Or, yeah, I'd, I'd love I'd love a personal account of that. I think you'd have to say try to apply, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't apply it. That, that's, that's the key. So I do ask myself what's appropriate, right? Because... Every day I have to, I, you know, I may not oh, achieve. Sorry, could I just pause you for a second? Has somebody got like a phone that is? Uh... Yeah, I have actually. Oh, okay. How dare you? Even... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, I need to, I don't even know why it's, got... it's vibrating. Like, hang on. You're a busy I'm man. I'll turn my mic off. Ask Leo or something. I'll turn my mic off and do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, it, it's fine. Oh, maybe I should bring Leo in. Um, <laughs> no, that's good. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm back. I, I, so that, okay, well, back. Like, okay, like, okay cool, I want to cool, answer cool. the virtue in your life question. Yes. <laughs> so, so yeah, no, that was awkward. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. That was, no. that was inappropriate, right? <laughs> no, no. So I try. I, you know, really. Um, so I wasn't white. That would be a good example of like, oh, I'll just put it on silent, but that'd be fine, right? But then I forget about vibration, so unwise, right? So okay, so <laughs> no. like, is it appropriate for what I'm going to do right now? No. And that's a really good example of how I, I try and fail, right? So I do I do ask myself like questions like, is it appropriate, right? What is appropriate? How do I decide that? Because I think we've said before that it's not about thinking thinking about something. Because you can, get, you, can, you can get really dangerous if you think something's appropriate just because you sit down long and hard enough to think about it. This is why the, the method of choice is the Socratic method or the Socratic dialectic. If I'm literally, if I just see virtue as I can do a pull-up or I can't, right? Because once I know how to do a pull-up, it's almost impossible for me to do it wrong, right? So if we can get, if we follow too tightly Leonidas's viewpoint, we don't look at the pro-social bit, which he was also showing, but if we, folk, if we block that bit out, we go, well, as long as I can do a pull-up, that's great, right? And I always, every time I do a pull-up, I will do it properly, right? And, but that's missing the point from the Stoic perspective, because again, from Marcus Arutus' perspective, you have to look at the whole. And me being able to do a pull-up, of course there's something appropriate about doing a pull-up in the right way. But in terms of my pro-social nature, it doesn't really say much, which is why Leo and I talk about the difference between courage and, and say moderation, as opposed to discipline, because I can be very disciplined and do, do the pull-up and then ask myself, why am I doing this pull-up? So I guess like even in something, that kind of question, like why would I want to do a pull-up properly? Because I'd say, well, I want to be able to train my mind so that when I'm in a community setting and I'm facing something that I don't like, because I don't like doing pull-ups, by the way, then I will have, you know, I will have the mental strength because I've been training it to stand up and do what is do what is right. So like sometimes I'll say things like, should I, you know, somebody asked me, can you can you look at a chapter of mine I've just written? 
Now I'm thinking, well, I'm not getting paid for that, and I have to, I have to juggle my my day around. And then I ask myself, is it appropriate? If I don't do it, who else will do it? Am I the right person to do it? Because the key thing about deciding what's appropriate is your role, which Leo didn't didn't get to because it, it, it's a it's a difficult thing to to consider. So you say, what is my role? So if I'm a father or I'm a son or I'm a brother, my role is different, which is why we say in the circles of concern, I want to be just to Matt, but I can't treat Matt like my kid, right? Because that would be unjust. So I don't treat, every, I'm not called to treat everybody the same way when I'm being, well, when my virtue is being made manifest as justice. It also recognizes, okay, who is Matt? What is his role? How do I relate to Matt? Because I can't treat, people say, oh, then justice means treating everybody exactly the same. That's justice, that's being fair. And that's just not, you know, that's not being fair at all. So we, sometimes we say, oh, it's, it's not fair because if you're, let's say you're British, you have an advantage over being, let's say, Spanish because you speak English as your, as your native language and, you know, Europeans, they have advantages over that. We need everybody to be treated exactly the same. But that's actually really unjust. That's actually really inappropriate. So it's also about recognizing who you are. And the important thing to me about virtue is it's a capacity. It's the capacity to, to recognize what we should have fear of or, or not in terms of courage. And wisdom is the capacity to recognize what we should do, why we should do it, and with whom. So we, when we look at contemporary Stoic books, we normally don't look as, at the virtues as a capacity, which is, why this, which is why they can kind of remove the soul so easily. Because as you build the capacity, your soul thickens, which is why they say the last soul to burn through is the sage. Now, if you, if you don't go back to the original uh, Greek, and Leonidas just pointed this out to me, then you actually re reduce the virtue to a thing that's external to you. Whereas capacity is something very much attached to you, very internalized. And this is why I think it's so dangerous when you have uh, the, the remove the theology, because you're, you're literally ripping out the very soul, <laughs> the very core of Stoicism, because all your ethical framework is built on the fact that you are virtuous and virtuous, or you have the capacity to be virtuous. It's the capacity. And you have that capacity when you build it into your very character so that you slot, you know, you right slot right into the community where you're standing in because you recognize your human role, so your pro-social role. So it's not just doing a pull-up, it's doing a pull-up for the right reason, right? Because everyone can do a pull-up, you know, if we train hard enough, we can all do pull-ups well. What is my reason behind that? And then saying, what's my role in, in the community? So yes, I am a human being and I share that with everybody. But what is my role that is not unique to me, but at least attached to me? And how do I then walk, you know, how do I then uh, communicate with others? How do I then act in accordance with nature within that role? Which is why Panitis is, and advertisers really uh, double down on the importance of role. And I don't see that, unfortunately, in contemporary Stoic um, books, because it talks about being a good Stoic as if we don't have a role. <laughs> Almost like if we choose to do good things, you know, quote unquote, choose to do good things like, I don't know, we have an ethical banking, uh, an ethical bank, or we decide to eat organic food, or we decide to be vegetarian. And that's missing the point entirely. Because once you build the capacity, you can pivot, you can say, you're not attached to a prescription, like, I, to be good equals being vegetarian. So regardless, whatever happens, I will, I refuse to eat meat. There's no capacity there. That's just a decision. You're just saying, okay, I, I, no matter what, I will just have that as a rule. And there's, there's no flexibility in that. There's no, there's no strength of character because you're just saying it's a rule. Why do you do that? Why do you do that rule? Oh, because I decided that was a good thing. Well, in every single circumstance. Uh, Stokes would say absolutely not. For example, if you're in a Pacific island and you don't, you know, and your main, the main diet is fish, is it really appropriate to start demanding you get, I don't know, tofu or something like that? I mean, it's, it sounds ridiculous, but... If you're going to be a leader of the community and you're going to be a role model, you don't want to be sitting there teaching the, you know, the people around you that it's more important that you have this very strict rule as opposed to being pro-social and saying, well, if everybody else eats fish around me and I'm not allergic to fish, then why wouldn't I eat fish? And why wouldn't I you know, have a pro-social attitude? Because that's part of where I am right now. So yes, I can go back to Miami and I can have a different diet. But it's also like, what, what's appropriate right now? So that's a question I ask myself all the time. Uh, and it's hard, right? It is hard because it always depends on who I'm talking to. 
which is also why I get frustrated with like social media because I'll say, Leonidas said this, therefore he's a bad person because he doesn't agree with what is currently the right thing to do. We should counsel him. And it's like, well, did you take context into consideration? Do you know who he is? Have you spent time working out what he really meant? Which is why in stoicism, whenever we decide what's appropriate, we also have to define what we mean when we say a certain terminology. So if we use the word, I don't know, vegetarian, what does that mean? And what does that mean right now? And so that's the things that I ask myself. And, I, and that's also why I say that all my identities that I have, the stoic one is the one I most treasure because I have, to, I have to grab hold of it every moment. And the minute I let go of it, I've lost it. And I'm no longer quote unquote stoic or at least a stoic uh, progressor. Mm. Yeah, Kai, I think that one thing that I have got from you uh, that really changed the way I think about it, this is just recognizing that, uh, I guess in every single situation, kind of like Seneca said, every single situation calls for advice and uh, you can't just make a, you know, a one single statement that this is, this is how I'm going to do this for the rest of my life because, and, and you went to very extreme examples with me in one conversation, um, uh, you know, and, and pointed out that uh, I believe it was you who said, you know, there might be a situation where the virtuous thing to do is to kill your father. You know, there might be a situation like that. Now, hopefully you don't ruminate on that so often that it becomes something that you're inclined towards, right? But um, but the, the idea is that there could become a situation where things could get so dire and, you know, uh, so out of control that, you know, Th- th- this this is what this is the advice you are called to um and so yeah, it's you could you would eat your i think i said you could uh, uh kill your parents and eat them there would be because that's there's you say in a you know generally speaking there's there's no you know gem, on the general day-to-day situation i can't think of a common situation where going you know killing my parents would be the right thing to do but one could imagine for example if their parent was was a fascist yeah. And they believe that they, they have tried to speak to their parent or parents, right? They have tried to show them where, you know, you know, dad, mom, look at our country. They're starving to death. This is completely unjust, right? Complete. This is, and you've tried everything. You've tried to persuade. You've used the Socratic method. You've sat there and you've said to them, why, what is your reasoning? And they don't want to reason. And then you have a choice. Like, then you say, is it appropriate for me? Like, it's not just because I'm a son. It's also because, for example, do I have the ability? Do I know it? Do I actually know how to, to, to kill? Would I know how to do it? Would I, would I, would, would knowing myself, where, how would I do it? And at mm. that moment, you might say, that is the most just thing that I can do because I have tried every other thing and it hasn't worked. And now I'm in, this is why Stoicism works so well. It's very black and white and just works very well in the greats because mm. we are very black and white. It's either just or it's not. You either did a pull up or you didn't. You go, I nearly did a pull up. Well, you didn't do one then. <laughs> so, or yeah. Yeah, I'm in Miami, I'm not. So you're sitting there going, okay, right now, what is the just thing to do? What's mm. my role? Is it just now? And then one minute you've, you might have the knife next to your dad's neck. And he's like, actually, I realize now if you've driven this way to kill me, I now realize that I'm being unjust. And at that moment you would say, okay, it's no longer appropriate for me to kill him, right? Because Right now, and obviously you'd have to think, I, I believe my dad and I think he's now understood. So it's a moment by moment by moment. Like Leon and I just said in one of your talks, like it's not that somebody blew up my country and therefore I have, can, I have the right now to go into war. Hmm. It's do I have the right, you know, what's my obligation? Stoicism isn't about particularly rights. What's my obligation to my people? So hmm. we, Leon and I also wrote a piece uh, about, Mary Beard's claim that Julius Caesar and, and Marcus Aurelius were just as bad as each other, which if you look at numbers of how many people died during the, you know, during the wars, then you can argue a case, yes. But you also have to argue what was his role? What was he doing? What, was his, what were his choices? How did he treat these people? When, when could he be flexible? When couldn't he be? Because sometimes mm. you can't be flexible. I don't know, Leah, if you wanted to give the example of like, sometimes you have to punish somebody, even if you, like, because that's your role, even if you think that, it would be better if you didn't, but because you're the leader of an army, uh, it's better to at least publicly punish them, even though you understand exactly why they did it. I, I think you've given a really good example before on that. Yes, um, right. So I think you pretty much covered everything, but I would I would add that like I could imagine a situation in which you have a stoic soldier and a stoic general, right? or I, I would even go far as to say a, a sage soldier and a sage general, and the um, the sage general gives an order, right, and 
given his social role or her social role, there's a there 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 is a hierarchy, and this is what needs to be done in order to win the war or whatever. But the stoic soldier could say, look, you know, all things being equal, I'll, I'll obey because I don't have the whole plan. However, if I have good reasons to believe otherwise, right, um, or by the time it gets down to me, it, it the uh, the situation has changed or now becomes it requires me to do something that I that can I cannot do so as a human being, right? Um, then I I have to say no, I'm not doing it, and I'll take the punishment and f everyone, right? Because at the end of the day, like um, Epictetus says, like you know, look, it's your job to kill me. It's my job to go without complaining about it, right? So you do your part, I'll do mine. You don't have to apologize for killing me, and I don't have to apologize for doing it with a, with a smile on my face. So, uh, at the end of the day, like um, social role because of the world that we live in. So, so it's not, look, if we were all sages, we would have no government, no religion, right? Um, you know, we wouldn't have any marriages. But because of the world we live in, we have these social roles. Um, it may the, it may seem to conflict. I mean, look, if if two sages are friends, you know, given the Stoic theory, like sages anywhere anywhere benefit each other. But if that's true, then even when you you cannot you know, you cannot be lenient. You have to set an example. Well, at the end of the day, the Stoic understands that punishment isn't indifferent, right? Isn't indifferent. Only virtue is bad. And um, this, I think, takes us, um, well, at least for, for my field, right? It's very interesting for the Nuremberg, the, the Nuremberg defense, right? I was just following orders. Look, one thing is to follow orders to, uh, you know, take, a, take, take Hamburger Hill or take the, this machine gun position, you know, take no man's land. But another one is to, you know, against my lie to say, well, I killed everybody in the village. I was just following my lieutenant's order. Well, hold on. You went beyond what you can do as a human being. So to be able to say this, to be able to say, like, look, I'm not going to do it. And I understand that you have different information, but I have I'm here on the ground. And if I'm going to be punished, then I'm going to be punished. But that's not an evil. You do your part. I'll do mine. I think that's what mm. the Stoics, the Stoics tell us over and over. Right. Hmm. Mm, yeah, I think uh, hopefully everybody's uh, writing down questions at the moment. We can dive into that soon. But uh, the 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 only thing that I am worried about is if there's any kids out there who believe currently that their parents are fascist or fascists. Um, and so I just want to place a warning out there. You need to be pretty damn sure that the consequences of you <laughs> doing what Kai was telling. <laughs> I'm just going to put the disclaimer out there. Um, uh, but uh, the, this is... Um, I mean, that's why you can't just say that's why you can't just decide by yourself. This is why I've always maintained whenever you said to me, if if I'm a really good musician and I just should just do really good music. Yes. But if you're a kid and you're sitting in your room plotting, right, there's no Socratic dialectic. Because I have said uh, in a piece literally yesterday, if you are wrong, if your reasoning is wrong, it is even worse in isolation because you start to believe that you're right. So if you really were plotting, it's not, it's not, a sage wouldn't sit there and take a decision unilaterally. They be, that's why we, that Zeno is talking about the community of sages. This is the problem I have with titles called How to Be a Stoic. Because Zeno was like, how to be a republic, right? <laughs> he didn't, it's literally in the title. He's not interested in the individual stoic per mm. se, or the individual stoic. This is why it's all about community right? Mm. Belonging to each other. That's why there's no marriage. It's not because it's anti, you know, the institution. It's that nobody belongs, you know, to one particular person. We all belong to each other. Our bodies mm. are for the community. So if you're a kid aged 14 years old, sitting in your room, thinking about how to plot against your fascist uh, parents, that's not, a, that's not for me a stoic thing to do because there's, there's no way that you're building community there, right? The fact mm. you're isolating yourself by very definition, the fact you're actually saying, I'm going to cut my branch from my family without even discussing it, tells me that your reasoning is absolutely flawed. Mm. This, is why, this is why the method of choice is like, Simon, you want to produce a piece of music and you want to put this swear word in, right? So, and shall we discuss about why this swear word needs to be in it? And you, you might say, I need to do it because I'm making a point about the fact it's only a word. I'm like, okay, well, why is it, why that particular word though? You could have picked another swear word. And then you and I would come together and then that, there's an objective truth in that moment between us, right? Because there is, we're not relativists. We don't say, oh, well, these, see, these group of people can do this because they're this, you know, they belong to this religion. And these group of people can do something else because they belong to that one. That, that's not stoicism. It's the objective moment is when we all decide in this Zoom meeting, for example, that we're going to have the paint, you know, the wall painted blue. And that blue becomes the objective truth because we've all display, explained why it should be blue. 
And the minute you introduce somebody else into the mix, you can then again, it's like, okay, what about now? What about this moment, right? Now we've got somebody else and they're like, they're the expert of real estate. And they're like, actually guys, if you paint it white, your rooms will look bigger. And if your goal is to sell the house for as much money as possible, then I suggest it to be white. Then you all then go, oh yeah, if that's my goal, if that's our joint goal, then mm. that makes sense. So the moment that you're sitting there in your in your room, you know, in your dark space, thinking about how terrible your parents are, like, like a corn song or something, then you you've lost it. You've you've literally did, done what Marcus Aurelius has warned you against hmm. because you're not you're not talking in community. So if I were to make a decision to remove a fascist dictator, the best thing that I can do is find you know a band of brothers and sisters to talk to this about. Find really friends. Again, this is why the sages operate in group, you know, as, as friends. And this is why mm. we're having this debate entirely the way that we're doing it, because it's exactly how the ancient, not exactly, but it's how the ancient Stoics said, we come to consensus. And I expect Matt and Marcus and Scott and yourself and Leo to push back against me when I, when I say mm. something that's incorrect. And then well, my- reason with me like why that's the case. Well, yeah, maybe one thing that I could throw in here. I think um, I would say that I think that it is when we're practicing this dialogue between each other and when you do like, for example, what Seneca said and you pick you pick a great teacher who you say, this is clearly a genius teacher. I want to learn how they think about life. And, you know, so you pick that person, then you really spend a lot of time with them. I've been finding this with Seneca lately because, you know, he's the only Stoic that I've been reading lately with the series that I'm doing. And um, and what happens over time is when you have those conversations and when you direct your study towards certain people who you truly admire and want to be able to uh, uh, experience a communion with, I would say, um, what happens over time is you end up developing this kind of uh, this uh, group within your mind of people who you can call upon for wisdom. And so you can almost have that Socratic dialogue within yourself in each moment um, by pitting these certain sages and philosophers against themselves, but also getting a better sense for your own personal needs as in know thyself, you know, what what is truly right uh, for you to the extent that it doesn't affect uh, negatively other people. Um, and, and so I'm wondering how this uh, unity of virtue idea fits into what I also see in the Stoics, which is this path to better developing the, uh, the, the sage that is within your mind that is that you are aiming at or the, the, the capacity for internal dialogue in each moment. And the, I guess the reason why I ask that is because I could, I personally couldn't imagine anything more annoying than calling upon ten other people to tell me what color my wall should be, personally, right? And 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 that's that's because, you know, well, I I don't know exactly know why, but of um, course, but also, also give it, I gave it. I mean, it was a, I gave a simplified example because yeah, when I'm removing yeah. a fascist, I'm not just yeah. affecting my room, right? When yes. I'm removing yeah. a fascist, I'm. You know, it also comes back to wisdom of who, how, and what, right? Yeah. So if it literally is your wall, but you're married, I would assume that you should really speak to the person that you're married to, right? Because they're living in that space. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you can ask me, right? And I mean, Sto- you know, Stokes aren't sort of like, okay, every single decision, should I eat a chocolate bar or not, right? Because mm. if it only affects me, right, then I probably, you know, then I don't have to really think about it too much, right? Mm. I do have to think about when I buy it, like, okay, when I buy it, like, what does this mean? Where am I putting my money? Who does that affect? Because, you know, it it does Mm. have a chain back to it. But in in the case of, in the case of a, you know, dictatorship, you're affecting a whole nation or at least a city state, right? So it's not a case that I can just make a unilateral decision to, also because if I remove a, a, a tyrant, I also have to be pretty sure that we've got something in place to replace it mm. because, or place them, sorry, or the system, because otherwise what we have is, is, is chaos and not in the reasoned chaos, because then you say, is what I'm going to do any better than, than what we've already got, which is also why it would be better that I would sit together with people to decide what's the best course of action. But I think Leo would be better at this because he's just warfaring. Well, can I just jump in which is very quickly? So it seems to me like uh, part of what you say, and this this relates to what we were talking about in the last session in terms of what belongs to you. Uh, it, it, is there perhaps the sense that when the decision only 
is within your realm of it only affects you you have that dialogue within yourself um then as you almost like the structure of a company as you broaden out and as you know you need to develop a a whole uh hierarchy in a system for example marcus aurelius if he's making a countrywide decision he's going to need to call upon you know these 10 people around him who are in charge of certain districts and certain uh you know areas of the country um and so it's it's almost like uh yeah this role ethics really comes into it that everywhere you need to be considering what is my role here who do i need to call upon for advice does this just affect me or is this something that i need to be bringing more people into the into the into the game with um i got to tell you something i i think you're absolutely right about um role ethics i would question i would wonder given the stoics metaphysics about the uh, how everything is so interconnected right how the reason mm. permeates everything everything's so interconnected to what extent can anything be truly only your decision? Yeah. Um, I would wonder that. Like for for example, like let's take a like look at Rubellius Plautus, right? So, a cousin of Nero, right? And he's a uh, near he's a threat. So he's already been exiled. He's in wherever, right? And he's he knows that Nero sent soldiers to come kill him. Who's there with them? Well, his closest friends, among them Stoic philosophers, right? Musonius Rufus is there. And he's debating whether or not to raise the force to fight off Nero's soldiers for however long, and then maybe start a rebellion, and then maybe be able to fight Nero. And among, you know, it seems like some of his soldiers, some of his friends are telling him, like, look, you could, you could send, you could raise an army and maybe rebel and maybe send all these young 20-year-olds to their death trying to fight for your sorry life right? That's one decision. We'll call that plan A, right? But there's also plan B. You could say, okay, well, my life isn't, my life at the end of the day is indifferent. And I could have other people fight for it. And maybe, uh, d- you know, t- to the extent that I'm able, destroy, you know, this part of the empire. Or I could just take it like a man, so to speak, right? And then wait for Nero and say, look, it's your part to kill me, but it's my part to take it like a, like a human being and a stoic. Right. So I think this is um, I I would wonder how much of anything is really our decision. Truly, I think you have a great point. I mean, if I'm painting my house, like do my do 10 of my closest friends really have any say in it at all? Right. I, I think, mm. of course. Um, but even to the point of is my life worth saving? Even rebellious Plautus, right, is asking, you know, 10 of his closest friends. All right. And I think you cannot take this away from stoicism. The, uh, yes, you have these uh, hegemonicon that must make the ascent or, you know, withhold ascent. Uh, ascent or withhold ascent or reject it. But being the kind of political and rational animals that we are, I think the Stoics would have understood that, like we said last time, right, if this body is not mine, if my soul is not mine, if I, if like Marcus Aurelius, right, and like our Marcus here, you know, we've, in, the, in the German forest, right, is, is, Every if every decision I make have this interconnected chain of cause web of causation, then I have to act accordingly. In my in my own country, my name is Marcus, right? Like Marcus says. But here on the frontier, I am you know I am Caesar or whatever. And um, is any the question I would risk ask? Can a Stoic say is any decision truly mine alone? Or that's not what I mean. I think, of course, at the end of the day, you know, any decision is yours. I completely understand that. But if any decision affects this circle and this circle and this circle and that circle. To what mm. to, to what extent is any decision truly merely my own? Is a question, right? Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I think now might be a good time to uh, let everybody else jump in with their questions. But you know, all, all I really have to say on that is that I I agree that we need to think a lot more about this interconnectedness because it you know you don't have to think about that for long until you realize that every single thing that you do uh, leaves ripples throughout the entire cosmos it's like you know like that you, you can't help it you, you can't possibly help the fact that that will happen um and what that then means about how we should act and how we should make our decisions obviously is um is a topic that will take us our entire lives to figure out um how to you know how to how to mitigate but 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 i guess something that i wanted to add is just i've I'm going to have to um, perhaps really, perhaps bring this up in the the discussion that we're going to have at the very end on God. But you know, I've been reading a lot of uh, Seneca lately, as I said, and his 
it, it seems like if you read from start to finish through his letters, he's kind of taking you on this path, showing you how he is trying to grapple with this very question. How do I get as close as possible to that that little burning point where you pop out into everything and realize, like he says, literally, uh, you know, we're trying to put ourselves on the same level as the gods. When, when he talks about this sort of stuff, he says, you, you know, no man can, he, he, I read this last night. He says, no man can do wrong when he uh, aspires to, oh, what is it? When he aspires to, um, yeah, raise himself to the heights that we have fallen fallen from, right? Which is similar to the Christian principle of, you know, there's the fall of man, which is we were in this perfect state where we, we you know, when we evolved or whatever, you know, when, it's, when we were kind of in communion with the totality of everything and we could not be wrong. We were the sage almost. And then we fell from that by way of, uh, you know, what, I'm not going to dive into the theology because I don't know. It. <laughs> but but Seneca talks about we've fallen from this state and that's where we're trying to get back to. Um, and so I think that that would be interesting to discuss how it relates to the unity of virtues as well, because Seneca certainly seems like he's trying to get to that point of perfection, even though he recognizes and says we will never get there um, and it's it's impossible. So I, I don't know why I threw that in just at the end. No, I do think what you said about the Christian thing, it's not they couldn't be wrong because they were wrong to Christian theology. It's more like they turned their back on, or they turned their brain, they turned their back on the source of correctness, the source yes. of truth, the source of righteousness, right? Again, these are very Christian terms, but you can definitely see like when we decide to not live according to our nature, when we, when we strike uh, the branch, we then turn, we become, we dehumanize ourselves, actually. Is, is, I would say yeah. that is the correct term. And we dehumanize others. And then we seek, then we make, you know, consistently make judgments where we misunderstand what's important. So mm. if you all consistently believe that wealth is, wealth is great and that's the thing you should go for, then and everything sort of is a domino effect. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this, this, and this because I know that this is going to get me where I want you've then you've literally dehumanized yourself you've dehumanized others because you've chased what is incorrect you've turned your back from the community and mm. and become an isolated individual and then you start to do the thing i said where because you don't then go back into the community you then start to believe that you can make decisions unilaterally and i would argue quite strongly that the us has, has these problems with certain ceos precisely because they start to, they see themselves as leaders but not leaders that need to communicate, but leaders that can take unilateral decisions. Like my key thing is to keep the sharehold price high. It doesn't matter how many people have to fight to do that. That's my hmm. main goal. And the misery, the human misery, I would say, that can be caused when somebody, some one person decides to take an unjust decision, when they've cut themselves up, cut themselves so far, you know, threw themselves so far from the branch. So I do think that the, the Christian, the Christian, um, story or myth or truth, depending on how you see it, does it, you know there are obviously there are links to how you know or at least parallels to how a stoic would see it. Okay, we wouldn't use the word righteousness because there isn't sin as such. Uh, and if you said, oh well, turning yourself away from the community is a sin, that's still not quite the right term. But I do think that that's where you were trying to get get at. I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, there's there's a lot more to discuss there. There's a lot more that I need to explore. Um, yeah, I just know that I've, you know, as I've been write, reading Seneca, I've just been finding uh, just these strange little commonalities that exist, and which obviously will be there because Christianity was influenced so heavily by the Stoics as well. But anyway, I'm gonna okay, I'm gonna let everybody jump in with their questions because I know we're um, getting on to uh, probably about an hour here um, that I've been talking, and I'm I'm sorry for going over time, but uh, to everybody who's listening on the podcast. Uh, you can find the rest of this episode and the conversation that is about to ensue um, on the Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Simon J.E. Drew. Hey there, YouTubers. I just wanted to let you know that if you love this episode and you'd like many more just like it, then you can head to patreon.com forward slash Simon J.E. Drew. There you'll get access to exclusive episodes that haven't been released yet, as well as many other benefits. Also, if you'd like to work one-on-one -on -one with me in my coaching practice, then you can head to simonjedrew.com forward slash coaching. Talk to you soon.